Hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, our first uh, uh, iteration of uh, our Agricola card rankings here with uh, with Rainier and Lumen. So, guys, I uh, would love if you could just intro yourself very quickly. I think the community mostly knows you already, but uh, why don't you start off for us, Ryan? Hey, uh, yeah, I'm Ryan Orr. Go by the screen name, Randy Orr. Uh, I've been kind of in the competitive Agricola world for maybe about two to three years. I've played Agricola for almost 10 years total have a couple hundred games. Uh, I will admit I was trained into the Agricola player I am today through an in-person event with Lumen on some level. So he's corrupted me into this a little bit, but I have kind of branched out in my own way. And uh, yeah, uh, played a lot on play Agricola over the last like year and a half. Yep, and I'm Lumen. Awesome. Um, played a few thousand games of Agricola in my lifetime. Been playing for... I don't really know. Eight years or something like that. Uh, I've won a couple tournaments here and there. Uh, I'm technically the U.S. national champion still because they haven't had a, held a tournament in five years. So, you know, I just get to keep that title, right? Um, played, yeah, over a thousand games on Play Agricola. Played a ton of games with this specific card set. Uh, played multiple editions of Agricola, many player counts. I feel like I have a pretty good handle on these things and i've gotten to meet a lot of people in the community in person and hope to do more of that in the future too awesome thanks guys and for those that don't know me i'm christopher ho i have the pleasure of uh being with these two gentlemen today to talk through our card rankings uh I myself have quite a bit of experience with this set. Uh, it pales in comparison to to these two uh, these two gents, uh, and I'm just really really excited to dive in and get a sense of where they you know see these cards and and why some you know some like kind of rise to the top uh, above the others. So let's uh, let's dive in. We're we're here on the Ox page, and I know that uh, you guys are both uh, recording here. So would love to just start off with Braggart and, and Lumen. Can you tell us why Braggart is one of the best cards across all formats? Uh, sure. Well, actually, I wanted to talk a tiny bit about exactly what context we were ranking this car these cards in. So sure. this, this video yeah. is like specifically if you are playing the base revised edition of Agricola with 96 cards only, just these 48 occupations, just these 48 minor improvements, we are trying to rank these cards within that type of game that arises when you play with these cards um, and we're also going to try to be flexible on like what draft format you're playing with whether that's no draft at all if you're passing 10 cards of each type to everyone and everyone gets to discard three or if you're doing a more like step-by-step -step draft um, and we're trying to kind of like average the card rankings out among those draft styles um, yeah so as far as braggart goes Braggart offers a ton of bonus points. As the notes state here, it has the highest ceiling in this whole set with like a small exception that doesn't really matter. Um, and having that many improvements in front of you is not super challenging because you don't have to get all nine bonus points with 10 improvements for this card to be really fantastic. And part of that is because you get to play this occupation as late as you feel like risking it in the game. It can easily be your last action of the game for five to nine points where other people are like hoping they have one or two point actions. So you just got a huge advantage with that. No, that makes a lot of sense. And thanks for uh, for, for slowing my roll there. I was so excited to dive into the cards, but uh, thanks for setting that context of, um, you know, in Agricola, the cards are you know, something that essentially makes every action better, right? They they alter your actions. And Agricola is a very classic worker placement game. Um, and so, you know, for every action that you take, if you get a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a benefit, that's what uh, justifies you playing that card in the first place. Right. And uh, I would, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I was just going to add too on to all that. Uh, the, we're also largely talking about four player games uh, here. The rankings would probably shift a little at other player counts. Uh, and finally, for people who aren't aware, part of why we're discussing this set is this set was just implemented on Board Game Arena. So uh, there's a lot more play currently happening with this exact deck set. Yeah, absolutely. Good call. Yeah, 100%. Anytime, you know, the, the community has been waiting for this to come to BGA for a long, long time. And um, with it coming to BGA, there's going to be a whole new generation of Agricola players. 
And so uh, it's really exciting for us to be able to, to share some thoughts around, uh, you know, what's good in this set and what's not. But Ryan, we dive into, this is my favorite card that to have, my favorite card to see in my first pack. It's uh, my main man, the assistant teller. So, so hit me up, Ryan, with why this is so strong. Uh Assistant Tiller is partly very strong in this set because in Revised, uh, plows in this base set are pretty tight. There's very few cards that help you get more of them. So the only there's only one action space that normally lets you plow. It's also a card set that has limited point ceiling. With that Braggart is one of the few. And so you often, in order to have a very pretty farm, you need to have lots of fields, partly because there's also a lot of crops in this set and you want to plant your crops in order to score points and you need fields to do that. So the fact that they're limited, the fact that it's hard to score points, it's great to be able to plow on an action space where very few other people want to go. Yeah, and can you talk just like very briefly, just because I think this is a really important part uh, and I, we won't take this long for every card, uh, just so everyone knows, but it's a really important part of it is that that plow is on day labor. And for you know, for a lot of the beginners and intermediate players that are, are di diving into the game, can you tell us a little bit why, why, why that's important? Yeah, so when you start taking actions in a round, you have to always prioritize what you want to take. And so toward the end of the game, uh, a lot of times plow is going to be kind of one of the first actions off the board, as would, you know, family growth without room or a uh, pair of cows or that type of stuff. Um, day labor is often never taken or is taken late in the round. And so it's very strong to be able to have an action that other people are first picking be your like fourth action in a round. Uh, and one last awesome. thing about the tiller is that this specific set has three other day labor combo potential cards. So not only is two food and a field really good, but if you can pair that up with something you find later, that's that's going to be a monster. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so our next two cards here in, in the rankings, three and four, are Child Listen and Grocer. They both provide crops, and I'm going to throw them both to Lumen because I know Lumen just uh, just loves both of these cards with a with a passion so so lumen tell us about uh, the set of these boys yeah these are definitely a couple of my favorites um one thing that is going to become evident as we go through this video is that taking crops from the the grain seeds and the vegetable seeds action spaces is not very good you want to try to find ways to make that way more efficient than usual and looking at childless, you can see you get a food and a crop each round that you uh, are eligible for. And then grocer, you can see you can buy a grain and two vegetables throughout the game if you if you buy everything. So these are good sources to get both types of crops you need without going on those action spaces. So a bit more on childless. Childless says you can threaten to family grow and be ready to family grow when there's no pressure. But while you're waiting for grow to happen, you can collect the crops you want and some extra food that really sets you up nicely for the rest of the game. And for those of you who haven't played too many uh, higher level Agricola games, one thing in four player you always see is a fight to grow your family. And that's by building your room, taking start player if someone's already taken family grow so you can grow the next round. Childless basically lets you get out of that fight because you no longer care about wasting half of an action on start player. You can take your crop and a food the next round too and, you know, take a big wood pile that other people are leaving for you. Uh, Ryan, do you have anything else to add to that? Nah, it's great. You you get out an early room, you essentially can pop your family growth whenever you want, and in the meantime, it's sort of like you already took a family growth action because you're getting to just get a crop and a food every round. Right, and that crop and a food is kind of like the extra action that you would be gaining, in, in other words, what you basically said. And getting fake actions like that is going to be a theme of some other strong ox we're, we're going to see. Totally. Um, and then as far as grocer is concerned, um, there's a lot of food in this edition of Agricola. Uh, this isn't the most fantastic source of vegetables because they're kind of far down that pile. But it's a source of vegetables. You don't really need the vegetables early most games. Uh, so if you can get an excess of food somehow, for example, assistant tiller, if you're getting two food when you plow early in the game, you're naturally going to have more food than usual. In the middle of the game, you can spend that food on groceries. 
Um, so definitely not just day labor cards, but there's a lot of stuff that gives you extra food here and there. And having Grocer with that uh, allows you to have so much flexibility in what you can afford to do. You can steal improvements with it. You can plant crops surprisingly with it. You can build rooms with it. Yeah, just uh, it's essentially one card to uh, that hits a, a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, speaking of those kind of free actions on the Childless Bear, we're, we're, our next card here, um, another you know exceptional card that provides plows, is uh, is our plow driver. And so this is our first stone house occupation. And, and Rainier, I'd love just a quick few words on why this is really strong and why this is up here. So looping right back to our friend Assistant Tiller, plows are really limited in this set, so it's great to get them. Looping into that childless idea, as soon as you build a stone house, you play this card, and it's sort of like you family grow again, because now you're paying a food, and every round you're just getting a field. Again, plowing a field can sometimes be like a first pick action, and so you're just getting that action for a food every round, which is a great deal. Um, and then on top of it all, much like our friend Assistant Tiller, I think this card's slightly as high as it is, purely because this set also has quite a few other stone house ox, and if you get one of those to go along with it, you start building up some really nice combos. Yeah. And just for actually the audience as well, uh, uh, what hopefully, you know, we get a lot of interested Agricola players coming in. We will be sharing these Agricola card rankings publicly. And there are some additional columns in there that will show, you know, which cards combo with which um, and all that kind of stuff. And so we'll share that publicly. Um, if you're a new player, please come take a look. You'll have it available to you. And, you know, perhaps we'll even add some additional expert rankings in there as well. Um, moving on to the roof baluster, I'll just take this one. I think it's, uh, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, one food for, you know, up to five stone. Very nice late game card. Helps you renovate. Renovation plus major is an extremely point efficient action. And so being able to grab that at the end when, you know, it's hard to pick up stone potentially. I um, mean, just always knowing that you're going to have that stone reno at the end of the game with Roof Baluster just makes it a really strong, you know, point, point ceiling type of card. Um, the reason I took that one too is I wanted to really jump into this house tour because this is actually the first time in our rankings today that the two of you have diverged a little bit. And right. I would love to just quickly talk, talk about the reasons for that. I think I do want to make one clarification to one of the things you said, Chris. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And I love learning from you guys. You're Go correct ahead. that renovation with improvement is a really efficient action. The path to getting there can cause it to be an inefficient action sometimes. So if you correct. are spending yeah. two or three, make, let's say three or four moves collecting renovation parts and improvement parts, that's when your action starts to lose value. And part of the reason Roof Baluster is good is because it guarantees you all of the stone you need in just one action. Yeah. That, that's a super, super good point. And, and actually, I will even expand upon that because so much of my early struggles with scoring points at Agricola was because I would try to renovate. Every, I would always try to end the game in a stone house. And sometimes it's just a, it's just a disaster because it takes way too many turns to, to, to get that one nice point move, right? And so, yeah, I, I, thank you so much for, for sharing that, Lumen. Sure. Um, okay, so into that's the house story rankings. This is the first... The first time you guys diverge, we got Ryan here at, you know, rank 13 and Lumen at rank six. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, Lumen, you think House Steward is substantially stronger than Ryan does. And I would love to hear from both of you on this one. So, uh, Lumen, why don't you go ahead? To be fair, I'm not expecting the difference tier to be substantial. But um, House Steward is a card that you, if you have in your hand, you have the ability to both take a wood action and declare endgame point conditions for everyone. Uh, three bonus points is not trivial. Many Agricola games are won within one or two points, um, and there are some ties here and there. So if you know you are in control of either declaring this bonus or having this card staying in hand and not playing it, that's a big advantage in my opinion. And also being, I mean, knowing that you're going to angle for it early in a draft, I think is also pretty useful. Got I think it. everything... I think everything Lumen says is fair. I think I have slightly more hesitancy to draft a card just to withhold three points from the table. And too often when I have House Steward, I just feel like I don't want to play it because there's so many other kind of cards and combos in this set that lead people to bid, build big houses. Um, but it is it is very good. So. Yeah, I added in the notes. If you're at the end of 
this. Uh, if you're aiming to play House Steward, you'd better have a plan to have five or six rooms by the end of the game. Because <laughs> against good players, they're not going to let you win House Steward on four rooms. So hopefully you have yeah. the combo cards. And I guess this is just like, our difference lies in how easy it is to get those room savers. Yep. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Sheepwalker. Sheepwalker is a fun card. Um, lets you trade sheep for pigs and for vegetables and for stone and kind of along that same line as grocer it allows you to take what you know potentially is one action you know you manage to get a, a great big sheep pull and you know manufacture these actions where you're all of a sudden have vegetables in hand you'll all of a sudden have, you know maybe even breeding pigs in hand or maybe that little bit of extra stone that you need to make that renovation action powerful now, I need the two of you guys to tell me why you're so high on Seasonal Worker. Because, you know, I'm. this is where I diverge from you guys. I was actually, we did all of these things blind, guys, um, these rankings. So it wasn't like we, you know, we chatted about it and then made them. I was very surprised at how high these two guys, much stronger players than me, had Seasonal Worker. Uh, makes me think I'm drafting it much too late. But, uh, yeah, it just hit, hit me up on uh, on why this one is, is, you know, so much stronger than some of the other grain or, or vegetable generators that you guys have. Ryan, do you want to take it? Sure. I probably have seasonal worker just a little high, to be fair. But uh, <laughs> I mean, again, again, very broadly, taking crops on the other spaces is not very efficient. Uh, this set has a lot of combos. Um, and while I just above said that I don't always care to like defensively draft things, I'm always a little terrified of passing seasonal worker around too much simply because um, if you pass seasonal worker into an pass it into an assistant tiller or something else that's often nearly game losing. Um, and as we'll see, there's also a card of minor improvements that makes day labor a lot better. So uh, it, I just like taking the day labor cards of this set sometimes and uh, hoping to hit those combos myself. Right. And uh, among our rankings, it's really hard for us to discern like actual strength and immediate value of a card versus how early we draft it. I think we're going to be a little inconsistent in that. Just like it's a hard thing to rank. So um, I think the fact that you have it up at six involves some of drafting it early. I would fully agree that I'm going to draft this thing very early, even though I don't think it provides quite as much like generic value as some other cards highly ranked. Got it. And, and and this is actually the first of a run of cards where I didn't think they were as strong as, as, as you guys did, because we, you know, we can see here Conjure and then, you know, I got scolded for the scholar, but we won't jump ahead. Um, on the Conjurer side, though, um, I imagine this is similar in, in the sense that you get this early grain. Um, it's from a traveling player space. You get a little bit of early wood. And um, what you guys are essentially telling me is that this early grain is actually you know, perhaps stronger than, than I was giving it credit for. Is, is that fair to say, guys? I I really like early grain in this specific set. I like early grain and multiple overall sources of grain. I think there are some game situations and hand situations where Clay Oven is the best major improvement in this set, and you won't find that in original Agricola or once you start playing with expansions, but... I think there are enough cards in this set to make clay of and possibly the best major sometimes. So that said, early sources of grain like Seasonal Worker and Conjurer can be really nice. Got it. Okay. Um, let's dive into this Scholar then. And so Scholar is actually a really interesting card in the sense that it is very similar to Plow Driver, right? Once you get into a stone house, um, Plow Driver plows you a field at the beginning of your turn. Once you get into a stone house, Scholar allows you to play either an occupation or a minor improvement at the beginning of every turn. Now, before the, the cast, before the recording, these guys were scolding me about my big, big, big difference between Plow Driver and Scholar. Um, so t let's talk a little bit about that, just so you can help me and hopefully it helps the audience as well. Um, in my mind, that like one food for a plow is so amazing, but the one food for, um, you know, a minor improvement, and there's not a lot of printed points on the minor improvements, and you know, maybe an awk where, you know, uh, how late do you get it down? And a lot of late game awks are, you know, a little bit underwhelming to me. Like, I felt that that was substantially weaker. But what you guys are, are kind of telling me is that those free actions are, are more impactful than maybe I'm thinking. Is that, is that is that fair? Yeah, I think you mostly summed it up. Free actions are pretty good. Um, now, Scholar, it, it, this is also one where I think Lumen and I will admit, like, it's a hard 
thing to rank. Um, I partly have it up here because there are, again, a lot of combos and you can make it work very well. If you draft it somewhat earlier, I think you can pick some later game ox so that you actually have useful actions to play off of it. But in certain, in certain hands, yeah, I mean, it, it's not going to provide much value. But a lot of times I think you could craft your hand to make it quite useful. Right. And maybe this doesn't apply as much for this specific card set. But overall, when you play Agricola with more cards, expansions, previous version, or whatever, late game occupations are very handy, just because you can usually play occupations, um, partially this is with a later action, so that's less relevant with Scholar, but um, they're kind of drafted underrated, I would say, late game actions. Um, uh, but just to illustrate numerically, if you had like three two-point occupations, that don't care about timing in your hand, and you have Scholar played, you can spend no actions and three food to get six points later in your yeah. game. So it doesn't matter as much if the occupations aren't doing very much, as long as they're doing something. No, I actually love that, um, making me reconsider my ranking there, because uh, you're right, it, especially if you have Scholar or Seated Scholars in the draft early enough, if you cra it just it requires maybe a bit more thoughtfulness in the, in the draft than a plow driver would where the plow driver is going to obviously give you some benefit once you get into a stone house and the scholar requires a little bit more planning um stone cutter so i said i think stone cutter is pretty boring uh, it's the, the very thematic uh, solid but not a super setting card um helps you get out some improvements and some renovations um, a little bit of an easier way um and then storehouse keeper so another potentially early grain source uh ryan and i love this card and lumen is he's substantially lower on it honestly and i wonder if i wonder if that is for the same reason and that's that resource market is such a, a, a fantastic um it's such a fantastic action so i wonder if ryan loves it because it's such a fantastic action and lumen doesn't like it as much because it's such a contested action uh go ahead ryan i'll, I'll let you have the first word on this i think that's a lot of it uh so one of the constant jokes about me is that i uh like resource market action space too much in general and i find any excuse to spam it so of course i was going to rate this highly um but i i somewhat i i mean let's let lumen talk i i suspect though it's mostly because yes that that action space is very contested in the early game so it's hard to get on it exactly it's not very reliable you kind of want to draft early start player action cards which is you know not a great overall strategy often um when this works, when you get Storehouse Keeper activated two or three times in stage one, I'll rank it with you guys in the top 10 for sure. I just don't think uh, it gives enough benefit, honestly. Um, I would rather have a grain source like Seasonal Worker or Conjurer. I find those more dependable for early grain. That's it. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And that you can kind of see the inherent... Uh battle that both of you guys went through on that one and um, also with storehouse, Priest, keeper, so... with storehouse keeper ignore the fact that it can give you clay just straight up ignore it yeah. i that's a, a very good point again yeah if you're a, a newer player um you know a player just trying to get a bit better at the game it's uh that clay is a trap in 99 percent of circumstances um okay Heading into Priest. So Priest is the first of our small house strategy type cards or early renovation type cards. And so um, maybe Lumen, you could talk just a little bit about the uh, the strategy in general, just to kind of highlight the strength of Priest. Right. So in this specific card set, there are some enablers to, to say that if you want to renovate to clay or even stone very early, you can get a lot of benefit. And there are also cards that say if you have a small house for a long time, you can have a lot of benefit. So Priest is a key cog in one of those strategies because it lets you get either your parts for a clay room or the parts for your stone renovation once you're halfway to one of those goals with the effect, like added effect benefit of other combo cards. And because it's like a key in many small house, stone house combos, that's why I'm rating it so high. Yeah, awesome. Um, moving on to Tutor, the next card in our ranking. So Tutor is uh, extremely, you know, great point ceiling, but just like in a lot of these, you know, 
economic type snowball games. Agricola is not really an economic type snowball game necessarily, but once you do get to that, you know, first extra set of actions, it can kind of become that. And Tutor really slows it down. So Ryan, maybe just talk a little bit about the, you know, the intricacies of playing Tutor. Yeah, early actions are incredibly important. You can't afford to like waste them, but uh, it turns out in this card set, yeah, it's it can be very hard also to get enough points. And so if you have a hand that says that you're going to play five or six total occupations, spending one of your early actions to drop this down and make sure that you're going to get four or five, six bonus points at the end of the game can be worth that tempo loss. Um, and it combos nicely with that above scholar if you can you know set that up and just play all your ox that way um but yeah i i really like this one just because it's hard to get points in this set yeah i think we're all on the same page there um speaking about point ceiling uh master bricklayer is next and master bricklayer i remember when i first flipped through the cards um and like after I played, it was you know after I played like one or two games, I I thought Master Bricklayer was so broken. I was like this this card's ridiculous, um, and you know I I no longer have the same feeling about it. Um, but you know Lumen, maybe you could tell us a little bit about why um, it might seem that way. And I imagine actually that a lot of people that are newer to the game look at this and are like, well, like that understand the game enough, but not like maybe not quite maybe not quite well enough they're they're picking this you know first or second tell us a little bit about uh about the card right so in a best case scenario this is completely broken the problem is that best case scenario almost never happens the best case scenario basically involves you being the player who grows like twice more than anyone else early-ish in the game um you want to have four or five total rooms while playing this so that you're saving two or three stone per major improvement uh, there's also a factor that once you play this card, other players are going to be like, nah, no, nah, you're not getting all the majors. <laughs> We're going to fight you for them really hard. We're going to take that major improvement space. We're going to take the resources that make playing the improvements good in the first place. We're not going to let you use Master Bricklay in a broken way. Yep. Um, Master Bricklayer is much stronger in these lower elo games so you know if you're uh, you know an intermediate player and you get queued into an arena when it starts up next season with some really low elo players master brooklayer could be a priority for you because uh, it's a good way to win right. you know a yeah. little bit more than you might otherwise and i note there in the notes that if you aren't playing with any opponents it's the best card there you go uh there you go um, okay, so moving on to Clay Hut Builder, and so again, we haven't actually had the chance to talk about our our differences in the rankings here. And this is one where I love Clay Hut Builder. I'm a I'm a Clay Hut Builder, you know, fan, and obviously I like it substantially more than you guys. But this is actually one where you know Ryan is like pretty pretty good at still like Clay Hut Builder. Luma is like it's like an average tier card, and so there's there are some big differences here in where we put this baby, and would love to talk about it. Ryan, I'll let you go first. Because uh, you might balance out me and Lumen here. It, it, it admittedly is hard to renovate and then play this and then get the clay at a time where the clay is particularly useful. Um, you primarily want to use it to <laughs> build rooms, as Clay Hut Builder says, but by the time you get the clay to build the rooms, it can be pretty late in the game. And so that's one of the major issues. Um, but if you have other ways to make use of, the t of 10 clay via having a pottery or some other improvement stuff, uh, I still think it's pretty good, but yeah, and I'm probably too low on it. Yeah, you know, honestly, like the ways you guys suggest to use it seems like totally fine and good to me. Um, and it's possible that maybe I am experiencing what Chris might be, or what you might be suggesting, Ryan, is that it just is really hard to fit in sometimes. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, I, and I that... think. On that front, I maybe should rank it a little lower. Like when it works, it's quite good. But yeah, it's. I think if you draft it this highly, it's just going to die a lot of the time. So this this is actually though extremely interesting because there's a couple things that are at play here, right? When when we like all, you know, again, I'm not as strong as you guys are, but the reality is we all have a small sample size when it comes to the total number of Agricola games ever played, right? It's very likely that you know in my hundreds of plays. 
Clay Hatfielder has just worked out for me a couple of times, or there might be small differences in our play styles, even though we're all, you know, strongish players. Well, you two are extremely strong players. I'm a strongish player. Uh, there might be small dip differences in our play styles that make a card fit us better than others. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, as you guys learn and play these, like if you find a card that you really love, that seems to work out well for you, draft it with a bit more priority, right? Draft the, draft your favorites. If you're comfortable playing them and you like playing them and all that kind of stuff, because, um, I know that it feels like to me whenever I get clay hat builder, I'm just like, oh, this is fantastic. Like, build my fourth room out of clay. It's going to be right at the right time. I'm going to come around the second thing of grow. It's like, oh, it's just I love the card. But um, we'll move on from there and, and move to Harpooner. And again, Harpooner here, um, I'm a big fan of. I think immediately, like, I've played a lot more threeers um, than, than, you know, perhaps the average player just because I, I often play with my wife and my mother-in-law and, you know, we played quite a, a bit of three years. And when I saw the ranking difference, uh, I kind of immediately knew that, you know, maybe I'm overvaluing it because of my three player experience as well. I still often like I play four more often, but because of my three player experience in three player Harpooner is like the, the best. There's almost it's very hard to get read in three player games. I have a lot of good experiences with Harpooner. Um, really, it's a fantastic it's actually one of the. I, I will ask you, Lumen, because of your stream and your famous food engine. Um, do you think Harpooner is a food engine in and of itself? Because to me, it's like one of the strongest like food engine-ish type cards. Is it, am I am I pushing my luck here when I say that it is a food engine or, or not? In ish, compared right? to other occupations, there's not much better. I mean, I really think a food engine should be uh crops or animal support plus a major improvement I, I have a hard time saying anything else is a food engine but for supporting a big family this is by far the best occupation food source i would say okay um awesome stuff moving on to carpenter so carpenter uh rainer hit us up what's your thoughts uh, Carpenter's good. It uh, helps you reduce rooms. If you're planning a bigger house strategy, it saves you quite a few resources. Uh, it's convenient that it works on clay as well. Building clay rooms in this set, I think, is very strong. It is actually where Carpenter is perhaps strongest. Um, a decent bit of the time, I would build like a room in wood and then maybe two rooms out of clay. Um, there is a decent number of ways to reduce read in this set too, so that cannot be too onerous. And then on top of all that, we already saw that house steward uh, often is in the game and awards three bonus points to whoever has the biggest room. Carpenter in those drafts, I think, rises in value further as well. Awesome. Um, on to Small Scale Farmer. So Small Scale Farmer is the classic two-house AUK. Um, you don't always have to plan to, to be in two houses or two rooms, sorry, um, for the entire game to make this a strong card but it is certainly a card that you want to be in two rooms with for you know longer than normal you want to be in two rooms for longer than normal um sometimes this can enable some like really specific strategies where you stay in two rooms the entire game um, but other than that you know dribbles of wood are, are pretty strong and uh it's a nice way to augment a strategy where you perhaps maybe build a room later right but i uh, want to moving on to well i want to point out for sure yeah go ahead. that don't sacrifice a major part of your game in order to keep getting one wood around. If This is kind of like Childless in a way, where you might have to end it early, but in return for ending it early, you're getting something more significant. So like if Small Scale Farmer uh, has to turn off in round five because you're building the first room of the game, absolutely do that. And there's nothing wrong with having played an occupation for four early wood. That's like totally decent. Yeah, absolutely love it. Thank you again, Lumen, for, for jumping in there. That's extremely important to know. I, I, I feel like people uh, across all aspects of gaming and actually across all aspects of life have this like sunk cost feeling sometimes where they're like, didn't get quite the value that I wanted. So they end up making a, a, a suboptimal uh, move just to satisfy that. And so thank you for, for adding that, Lumen. Um, Hedgekeeper. I actually find Hedgekeeper to be a fascinating card. Um, much more interesting than it looks because of the dynamic of taking wood versus fencing versus how much wood do you leave to the table. Um, you know, I, I know you're both very big proponents of wood policing in general. So, uh, if Ryan, why don't you, uh, can you just talk a little bit about that aspect of the game? Because I think Hedgekeeper is a good opportunity to bring that up and just share a little bit of your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, we're going to start getting to a few more ox soon that involve it adding wood to the game. And um, wood is really important for scoring points. Like you need it to build your early room often, and then you need it for fencing. If you have extra, joinery and stables can provide you points. It's it's And a lot of improvements in this set need wood. So you want to be taking wood off the board because wood you're not taking off the board is wood your opponents are getting. Um, and so the more you play cards and get wood alternative ways you're kind of just helping everybody because they're now having an easier access to wood as well. So hedge keep is a very tricky balance of playing it so you benefit without leaving too much benefit to your opponents. Um, on that front, being able to get extra wood when you fence is great. Fences help you hold animals. Those are points. Those are food. Um, if you were taking a fence action a lot to the mid game, it means that maybe your opponents aren't fencing until late and that can work out very well. But um if you play this card too late, you're only going to get like one fence action out of it. So playing a card for a three wood action is okay, but unspectacular. Yeah. And, and I think you can, again, see a little bit, you know, obviously I ranked this card, you know, quite a bit higher than Lumen. That is probably actually a difference in play styles, honestly, more so than experience or, or any of like that. Maybe a little bit of experience on the Lumen side, but I imagine that I, you know, I'm more comfortable doing certain things. And Lumen, is, I know Lumen has a very hardline stance on his uh, his wood patrol of the board, and you know that's part of what makes him an extremely strong player. So um, I'm actually going to uh, just be a little bit more wary about my hedge keeper use, I think, in the future, especially playing with uh, really strong tables. Um, Moving on to Brushwood Collector again. Brushwood Collector is a is a fantastic card in three players. Again, I think that's that's partly a part of the reason my rating is inflated there. Um, but it's also a fantastic card for enabling bigger house strategies. One of the, like the, the the best feelings is uh, is drafting Brushwood Collector with Carpenter's Parlor, which is a, a minor we'll we'll chat about soon. But um, I personally love love. Uh, you know, having the opportunity to pair those two together. And we'll talk about Carpenter's Father and maybe have a, a bigger conversation about some of the bigger house strategies when we get there. Um, okay, Firewood Collector. Ryan, let's uh, let's chat about this one because you're, uh, you know, you're just not as big of a fan of, of this one as, uh, as Lumen and I. I, I think, think I uh, might know why. Go, but... go ahead. Go ahead. I don't. I, the, the, uh, people that know my playstyle also know that I often kind of push early room and I don't uh, play a lot of occupations early. I often play more in the mid game. This is one that you, I think, is probably best played early while you're plowing in the early rounds instead of taking like two wood off the board. Um, again, I also like to just take the wood off the board rather than inject it into the game. So it's kind of tough. It's an Aki you have to play early uh, to get some utility out of it. it. You do get utility out of it, but you get dribbles of wood throughout the game. It's just hard for me to ever feel like I want to spend the tempo on doing that. But why should I do it more often, Lumen? Well, I was actually going to say that I think part of your rating here is that you'd prefer to draft cards that help you with plows instead of give you stuff while you're plowing. Um, that's a big That's a big issue, too. Uh, as people might have seen, I, I rate plow drivers slightly higher than these guys, too. And uh, in the minor, I, yeah, I, I often am not plowing on the plow space very often. Right. And I think with this card, early game is when the plow space farmland is not specifically busy. So you can play Firewood Collector very early, plow two or three times in the first six rounds, let's say, like rounds one, two, and four, I don't know. And, you know, get three extra wood that way, have a bit of extra wood in the mid game also. I, yeah, I think that it's totally usable that way. I think my playstyle also avoids going to the plow space a lot. So I don't use it much, but I think overall it's fine. Yep, makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. You know, dribbles of wood are really good. And I think this is very playstyle dependent, to be honest with you. Um, Scythe Worker. Scythe Worker is a card that I. Uh, Scythe Worker is a card that essentially helps you grab grain off of the field in a slightly different way than you normally would. Um, and I always like I've watched a couple games on your streams and I've seen a couple Scythe Workers and like it feels like really strong players are like really thinking about exactly when you need to have the, your grain off your field to make sure that you are scoring points in the most efficient manner. Um, can you just talk a little bit about like the tempo of of uh, of plowing and sowing lumen just really quickly on the you know how to score the most points? Sure. So I think a lot of strong players will make sure that all their fields are cleared off 
for the last round of the game and aim for either the cultivation or grain util utilization space in round 14. Uh, because if you have crops in your supply, fully harvested, a bunch of empty fields, you get to have a huge point and or food move at the end of the game. Scythe Worker gives you extra tempo and flexibility in achieving that because it says your grain get to come off one harvest sooner than usual. And for my value of Scythe Worker, I think it also getting the grain off faster means that the clay oven type stuff gets better. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, on to Manservant. So uh, Manservant is our 24th ranked card. So we're about halfway through the set. Or I think we're exactly halfway through the set of occupations. And so Manservant is our cutoff for a top half awk, um, so to speak. Uh, Manservant is another stone house awk. Um, it gives you three food around um, once you get into a stone house, which is, I think, jumps off the page at some people. Um, it's Again, it's not as strong as Plow Driver. It's not as, as, as strong as Scholar. Um, but it is actually maybe at first glance, people will be like three food around. Like that's, that's crazy. That's like, yeah, I'm basically fed. Um, why is this, you know, maybe not up there with the scholar and the plow driver, uh, Ryan? There's a lot of food in this set. So I would rarely renovate early just to get the food. I mostly have this rated highly because again, the combos are great. Um, so if you're already doing scholar or plow driver, then man servants are really nice play for a lot of food. Even occasionally in some bigger house games, maybe you reno and you can play this late for like nine food, which is a decent action, but there is a lot of ways to feed in this set. Got it. Conservator. Okay. Lumen, my friend. 15, 15, 17 ranks above, uh, above Ryan and myself on the Conservator. Um, conservator need, to me. Y'all need to like again, your stone house combos more. That's all I gotta say. Good. Uh, okay, and so and so looming off the bat, you know, makes it pretty clear that uh, again, this is actually one of these cards though that looks extremely strong. Your first flip through, um, and I was actually very surprised because I, when I put it in there and I knew I was doing this exercise with you guys, I was like, these guys are gonna think I'm chumps. I'm gonna put it at 33. They're gonna they're gonna have it in in, in the 40s. Um, because you know, I, I, I thought that in my mind. And then when I saw Lumen with the 15, I was, I'm, I'm thinking about this the wrong way. And so it's, it's, um, you know, because re again, renovation plus major is a very strong action. And so you're kind of, you're saving yourself from this really strong action, which seems a little bit counterproductive. Um, but maybe I, I went from thinking conservator is so strong to thinking it's maybe not strong enough. And so, yeah, I mean, Lumen, do, did you have anything else to expound upon or was it really just as simple as? This I, enables a whole bunch of cards. Like you got it. You got to draft it. Yeah. So I think it has two great like purposes that you could use it for. Number one is the faster renovation to stone, and we've seen all the good stone house occupations already. Number two is if you have a big wooden house that you've had a tough time renovating because you're maybe needing to take more food actions during the game. Now conservator says you can ignore that clay action or series of clay actions you would otherwise need to renovate to clay before stone. If you're stuck on actions late with a big wood house, conservator can be a game changer. Yeah, no, awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think it's, um, it's one of these cards where maybe the rankings don't reflect exactly where you would take it because you can kind of see how much stone has support there is in the draft. And, you know, you either, you, you either draft it earlier or later or, or not at all. And, um, also, uh, uh, apologies to anyone listening. My my uh, pods just died, so I'm charging them quickly. But if, in case my audio quality falls off for just the next ten minutes or so here, I, I really apologize. Um, okay, adoptive parents. So, uh, Lumen, take us through adoptive parents here. Right, and I think the notes do a great job, like explaining this card. Uh, you have to examine the amount of food you're trading away for the actions you get back. And in the abstract, that's a good trade, but some of this food has to be like really early food. And that can make your actions in the early and mid game difficult if you're trying to afford adoptive parents along with any other stuff you're doing. For my play experience, there's too often some other card I would like to play at the same time as I would like to play adoptive parents, and I play that one instead. Can we talk, can we take a, a quick like aside here for a second and talk about that? Because there's this concept of like 
early game ox versus mid game ox versus late game ox. I would love to just ask the two of you, how often do you think about that in your drafting? Are you trying to construct like a, a seven card hand with, you know, two early game ox and three mid game ox and, and, and two late game ox, or is it like you're, you're too concerned with defending the table? Like what, how much of it just goes into that? And Ryan, I see you nodding your head. So I'll just throw it over to you first on, on that, like that way of thinking. It's really important that your hand is not like all early game ox. You're not going to play them all. And while it's nice to have options, um, if you just get to a point in the game where you have no cards in your hand, like you're limiting your options for good moves. And that means you're going to have a worse game on average, probably. Um, so yeah, what I'm drafting, I absolutely think about. I already have two or three ox I'm trying to play in the first couple rounds. I don't want more of them. I want occupations that I can play in the mid and late game. Um, and you still have to worry about combos you're passing and stuff. Drafting is very complex overall, but you absolutely should be thinking loosely about when you're going to be playing your ox. Right. I think that's pretty much exactly what I do. I think sometimes with this set, what I'll do is not be afraid to draft two sources of early grain cards. And I see early on based on what other players are doing, which one's going to be better for me. And I just like throw a card away, even if it's like a good generic early grain card. I don't mind drafting like two sources of the same thing once or twice in a draft, but definitely I'm looking out for timing. So no, I mean, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. And um, I actually think that separates kind of like really strong drafters from drafters that maybe understand the value of the cards, but not the tempo of when the card should be played. And so perhaps actually, again, in some of those columns we'll add for, for all of the players that hopefully do visit and hopefully, you know, gain from from this these card rankings, maybe we'll throw in like early game, mid game, late game, awk there, so that you can kind of sort by those as, as well. Uh, and then Loom, and this one is for you, my friend. Um, there's uh, anyone that follows the community or has seen any of Lumen's uh, videos. Um, this is a, a famous card. Actually, the very first stream I ever watched you, and you were playing this card, and the chat was freaking out, and I. Thought I didn't understand really why they were freaking out. So why don't you just tell the tell, tell our audience here about uh, the good old mushroom collector and your in your history with him? If, for those of you who have watched my strategy video with Shadow, we talk some about mushroom collector, and it it just doesn't provide you good food for the the entirety of the game. It'll trick you into thinking that you have accomplished your food for the rest of the game when it doesn't. Um, Shadow refers to these as a crutch. Um, they, I mean, Mushroom Collector is great if you want a bunch of early food. Like, if you have a grocer and you're planning to get a field with, like, a plow help card, like, Mushroom Collector can be great. But don't pr pr trick yourself into thinking that because, oh, I have 12 food in stage one, I'm going to be so set in the rest of the game. You are not. You are not going to be set in the rest of the game. And the other classic problem is we're leaving wood on the board for our opponents. Um, and so, yeah, you're often setting up your opponents to get bigger, more efficient wood actions. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, Ryan, tell me about Cottager. Um, I have this one ranked a bit behind you guys. I think it's, it's you know, it's not that big of a difference, potentially different play styles. But yeah, it's uh, tell us a little bit about Cottager and, uh, and it's, and it's uh, back here. It's mostly combos. If you don't have combos, Cottager is really boring and not that great. Again, Renovation is a great action because it also comes with a major improvement. Build Rooms is convenient because it blocks other people from building that round. You can only build one room at a time here. Um, on its own, it's not great. But if you have any of those other day labor cards, it becomes better. And there's a minor improvement that will get that uh, every time you day labor, you get three clay. That's a great combo with Cottager. It makes building a bunch of clay rooms pretty easy. Um, so it's a pretty speculative pick a lot of times, or it's a combo pick when you already know you have Seasonal Worker or Tiller. Also Clay Hut Builder, as the notes say. Like, if you can play Clay Hut Builder in round three, that's really cool. Yes, yeah. No, the, er, the, the early reno can be big, yeah. Yeah, and this is actually, I believe this is the only card in the set that allows for an early reno, correct? Yep. Yes. Um, I'm just thinking, I, I think that is true, okay. Um, and of, and of course, you know, for people that are very new to Agricola, there are many card sets in Agricola. This is the revised base set. Um, this is what all these rankings are based on. I'll just reiterate that. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, 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 Ryan and Luma will come back with me um, as new card sets get released over time as well. Um, on to Animal Dealer. So Animal Dealer um, at its surface is 
you know, potentially actually very interesting because it allows you to get, no matter what, a breeding pair of animals. Now, none of us have this card ranked particularly highly. I think part of the reason is that you don't necessarily want to be taking single animals off of a, off of a, like you don't want necessarily want to be taking single action spaces. Um, and if you do that, if you're not doing that, it kind of defeats part of the strength of the card. And so it, it makes it just hard to really generate a huge amount of value out of this card. And it's hard to kind of, you know, find all of these empty pastures and make sure you have a hearth and all this kind of stuff. So I just find it to be, a, you know, a card that doesn't really live up to how cool it seems to always be able to get breeding animals. Is that, does everyone agree here on that one? Yeah. I see, I see some nodding. Him, so I think we're all, we're all good there. Woodcutter. I am extremely interested here because I know Woodcutter, I did a quick bit of research actually on this one. It looks like it's actually on the, these power ratings on Play Agricola. It's not a very strong card. I was actually very surprised. Now, it looks like you guys are in the know on this one, and I am out of the know on this one because Woodcutter to me is, I understand that there are some problems with it. I don't have it ranked in the top 10 or anything like that, but I am, I am, I just don't understand. You guys have to enlighten me here as to why this card is, you know, outside of the top half of Ox because I never would have said that. So, so hit me up, enlighten me, guys, to teach me, teach me the lesson. Ryan, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you expound upon it. Uh, basically, you, again, you're you're injecting more wood into the game by taking a wood action space, but I think. I think everybody, the next time you think you want to play Woodcutter, count how many times you actually take wood from the wood spaces. Um, I think you're going to get a lot less wood than you think you are. Also, the timing of that wood is not very great. Like, you, if you get two wood out of it by round four, you've saved yourself a two wood action and replaced it with the play Woodcutter action. It, it's really that the utility of that extra wood is pretty low often got it because so it's is it more about the timing of the wood because generally and I, I really want to understand this one because i think it, it will help other people understand a, a really important facet of the game that i i myself want to get better at but house steward for instance for instance is one of our top rated cards it gives you four wood all at once which is obviously better than four wood over the course of the game um but you know is, is that what it really is? Is just the tempo of when you're getting that wood? Or is there actually a huge problem with putting that much extra wood into the game? Because, you know, I think Woodcutter generally gives you five or six wood throughout the game, correct? Five you know, to eight. Five, it's yeah. not like five to eight, yeah. So, so there's not, it's it's more about the tempo of that wood than it is about the the fact that it's 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 not that big of a problem to put that much extra wood into the game or, or am I... I just want to really understand from your guys' view here why it's more of an underwhelming card than you know I had anticipated. I think it needs to have a big family. To I think the best case scenario for Woodcutter is that there's a lot of actions in the game, everyone's grown a lot, and there's fights for three and two wood spaces relatively early in rounds. That changes those actions to four and three wood for you. And... Yeah, I, I really think the ideal case for Woodcutter is when two wood is commonly available, but three wood isn't. Got it. Okay. So you're cheering for some early growth. I like it. Um, moving on to Groom. So Groom is uh, the least exciting of the Stonehouse Ox. Um, it is essentially allows you to get some free stables, uh, or not free stables, but one wood discount stables. Um, for every single turn that happens when you've got a stone house. Um, it is some nice point ceiling uh, because, you know, fence stables give you points. Um, but again, it's just, essentially, it's just the least impressive of all those stone house ox. And again, where you draft this one, really, really, it makes a huge difference based on if you're going for a stone house early or not. Yeah, it's not strong enough. Farmer. It's not strong okay. enough to, like, encourage you to go to a stone house on its own. Um, this is Correct. mostly going to be played as part of a combo. Got it. Organic armor. Hit me up, uh, Lumen. Uh, I mean, it's not too exciting most of the time. How many pastures with at least four capacity are you going to have in general, let alone, like, put exactly one animal in? Uh, it's just, like, a hardish condition to hit. But 
as we've said before, bonus points are hard to get here. And so this is a perfect example of a good scholar card, even if it's only worth two points to you, because you're not spending an action to do it. You're getting two points that aren't available to the table and it's just there. You don't need to play it until the end. Yep. It's a great card to just speculatively pick toward the end of a lot of drafts if it's still there. Yep. Love it. Good late game mod. Very happy to pick it up, you know, sixth or seventh in a draft. Ryan, talk to me about the difference between seasonal worker and green grocer. Because seasonal worker is like your in almost I think it's in your top five or top six, and it is your green grocer is your 39th rank card. So obviously I miss some some part of me doesn't understand. And I, I do understand why seasonal worker is stronger than green grocer. Don't get me wrong. But there is a massive gap here, and I just hit me up with, with what's going on. Early vegetables aren't that strong, um, whereas early grain for feeding is um, off of the ovens and stuff. But vegetables aren't like that efficient for feeding. Um, it's mostly a points play. Um, so it's not like a great card to play early. And if you're playing it more kind of mid-game, late game, it, by the time you play green grocer and then like take grain veg twice, if you're just sowing all those crops you gained almost no benefit over like just taking grain and veg itself. Um, and so it's just really hard to like, the other big issue is you're, you're using the grain seeds action, which is just like not a good action. And there's not that many cards that combo off of it that are good in this set either. Um, well, there's a lot of cards and, that combo with it and most of them are bad. Yeah. That, sorry. That's what I mean. Like there's <laughs> not good. There's not good. Yeah. There's not like a lot of great reasons to be going there. So um, and, and, and you're just going to an otherwise bad action space. I don't know. It's, it's it's underwhelming. Um. Got it. Yeah, I'm with you guys. I will uh, really consider that honestly because I I have season worker and green grocer in the same realm of um, rankings, and I I, I love to to have learned that uh, just to get a better insight into like you know why that might not be the case or why that is not the case. Um, diving into animal tamer. So animal tamer is an another source of early grain uh, again. Uh, I think this this kind of goes going through this line by line. The first time I've ever done this, Lumen, uh, this clay oven take on clay oven being the strongest uh, card in the set. You know, it, it's looking more and more true. You know, as we go through line by line. But Animal Tamer, um, what do we think, Brian, about the uh, the actual? Forget the grain for a second. The grain is obviously very important in the card, but um, keeping an animal in, in every in every room of the house. How strong is that? Like, how much should we value that? It's, it's usually not that great. Um, it, it, again, this is a card that like suffers from when do you really want to play it. Um, it's kind of convenient to be able to like hold after you have like three rooms, you can hold a breeding pair. Breeding animals is a good way of like generating some extra food, but it, it, it's just tough to like super want to play this. But any card that you're playing to just get a grain isn't that bad on its own, and then it can let you kind of delay fencing or building stables while still having a few animals. So it has some utility, but yeah, especially again, underwhelming. If, if this is the alternative to building two stables on your first room, which by the way is usually not a good play, if this is the alternative, that's a good alternative. I have a question. I'm going back to Woodcutter here just for the audience as well and for myself. If Woodcutter is in the game, or what cards, what needs to be true for you to build one or two stables off of your first room? Like, how confident do you need to be that there's going to be a lot of wood in the game? I think that's the right thing to consider. Um, are people building a normal amount of wood rooms? Like, is everyone building exactly one wood room? Are two people ignoring wood rooms entirely? Uh, these are. Am I going to have a bigger family than everyone else in the mid game so that I can take the wood actions and do farming stuff? Um, and, and, and then the other obvious follow-up is like are you actually going to get breeding sheep real quickly if you're confident it becomes a bit better and if you have something like sheepwalker that's probably the scenario where i'm like really tempted to do it but otherwise it's that four wood should be another room or quicker full fencing yes so no it makes perfect sense and guys i'm back on um on my headphones here, so hopefully the audio quality came back up. I apologize for that. Good. Um, diving into Pastor. So Pastor is the one of the biggest single payoffs of any card. Um, it's also got one of the hardest requirements of a lot of cards. Um, and so Lumen, why don't you go into uh, 
into you know what pastor's all about here right pastor forces you effectively to be the last person to grow your family to three and that's just not a recipe for winning most games unless you're already like hardcore on a small house strategy so as a result i don't draft this one very highly very often i much prefer priest because that gives me like a more solid thing that i'm already aiming for in my opinion um maybe my pastor ranking's too low like three wood is totally good so i I, 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 I've been thinking I have it slightly too high though. It's, it is, it's so tough and there's too, there's too much, there's a little too much, uh, encouragement to stay in small houses for a lot of players. Uh, it, it, it's just such a tough card, but it's great when you fall into that situation, you're growing last anyhow, but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a card where you, you know, you pick it up near the end of a draft if you, if you're not planning to stay in two and then. If you end up in two and you end up last in the queue, then you know maybe it's your get out of jail free card. Um, consultant, and so uh, this consultant ranking, by the way, is uh, our consultant ranking for four player. Um, in three player, it's uh, you know substantially stronger, um, but in four player here, it's essentially your your one ticket, one one uh, one action pass to breeding sheep, and sometimes it's nice to be able to have that. I don't think there's much else to say about the card. Uh, if you guys do, obviously, it becomes much stronger when sheep are a part of your plan. If you've got, you know, a couple of the minor improvements that we'll talk about shortly, um, you know, or if you've got a any reason that breeding sheep are stronger than normal, consultant is stronger than normal. Um, frame builder, and uh, now we're kind of, it, in my opinion, and I don't know about you guys, but we're kind of getting into the cards that don't often see play. I would say kind of past consultant, like we're kind of we're kind of headed into that, you know, bottom bottom tier of of ox. And maybe you guys have a different opinion, but um, to the point frame where we builder, can probably uh, just take one or two sentences with these and like kind of rush through them. Yeah, we'll yeah. just like kind of fly through the rest and say, hey, it's. Uh, but yeah, so uh, frame builder, it's very. I I've never personally played the card. Um, it, 30. it helps with some re with some renovation strategies. Uh, not much else to say. <laughs> um, pig breeder. Uh, I, I wrote this note, but uh, I said it's a lonely pig and a lonely man. <laughs> um, Chris cut out, I think. Looks like it, but yeah, basically this is a great scholar thing or just it's a great thing to have in the back pocket if somehow you get blocked from taking boar otherwise, but very mediocre right it's two points whether you get the breeding with it or you don't it's, it's always going to be that one or two points difference so not much there uh while chris is still gone let's talk about cattle feeder uh, i like my note for this one uh it's just like what are you gonna do with a cow right now when you're taking a grain uh, yeah, it, it's so hard to like be in a position where you want the cows and you have the extra food and you're going to use it all profitably. And you, again, taking grain is otherwise pretty mediocre. You're it, This has the same issue as some of the other cards too. You're adding cows to the game, so now you're not going to take the cows off the board. So you often inadvertently help some opponent that gets to take cows that otherwise wouldn't. So. Mm -hmm. uh, loot it. Uh, I'll go to Lutinus. Yeah. There's only one. There's only one card in this set that encourages people to take traveling players, and that's the Conjurer. Uh, so a lot of times you're going to play Lutinus and get three food and three wood over the course of the game. Uh, that's really mediocre. If you got three food and three wood instantly, it would be an okay card, but you're going to get it like in round four, eight, and twelve or something. Right, like, and you only it, want to buy the vegetable in round twelve. You don't even want to do it in round eight. Yeah. So. Not a great extra effect there. Uh, Papermaker, we both have very low, and Chris has it a bit higher. Um, but I think we well, probably... Hey, welcome back. We're about to talk Papermaker here. You hear us, Chris? Try and get set up here. Okay, I think he might not hear us right now. Uh, yeah. But Papermaker, it encourages you to spend wood for food. And because there are so many ways to get food, and wood is just useful for so many other things. I think that's why we both have it pretty low. And it depends on what draft settings you're playing, but the number of times you're actually going to be playing, like your sixth and seventh occupation is kind of 
questionable a lot of times. So if you're only playing your sixth and seventh occupation for some food, yeah, there's just better things to be doing usually. Right. And then we hit Stable Architect. Yeah. Uh, Stable Architect I maybe should have a little higher because it does sometimes allow you to have some clever layouts on your farm and have a few stables outside. Um, it can work if you have something like Groom that's building the stables for you, but you really want your... The best farm would have your fences and stables in the same pastures, um, so it's a weird card a lot of times to actually net points off of. Right, it gives you bonus points for doing the exact opposite of a point-giving thing. Yeah. yeah. Hey guys, I'm back. Welcome back. I'm glad, glad I made it back for Stable Architect, uh, a card that, uh, yeah, exactly cancels out your bad play so uh <laughs> glad we're on that one um sorry for dropping guys had some technical difficulties but uh back in time for our friend geologist um uh, and geologist i think 48 chris i i had geologists <laughs> as our uh mr I, as a the the last pick of the draft i mean you know obviously uh there He's... could there could be worse <laughs> There, could there, are, there, there, are, there are worse. There are worse. Uh, yeah. but, but anyhow, everybody, clay is... You often don't need that much extra clay. It's hard to make a bunch of extra clay work, and playing an early card to get more clay is really dubious, so that's why he sucks. Right. Three-player geologist is fine. Two-player geologist is the top pick. Like, player count very depends. Yeah. Yeah, and I know... Uh, I don't. I haven't actually seen 100% where you guys ended up. I imagine up in Firing Boy is, is your, your guys' last one, but... Uh, Apparently it's only mine. Uh, what are you guys... Uh, probably uh, should I, be mine, but... We'll, we'll, we'll talk, but the next card I, is Sheep... The next card is Sheep Whisper, which is a, rarely a card that you want to play early, uh, but in order to get the full benefit, you have to... You, you just get too many Sheep early where you're not really going to need them. It's it's hard to find a game plan where you want to play this guy. Yeah, and you know there there are times where it can maybe make sense, like if you've got mini pasture or something like that, and you're getting an early fireplace. But it's so situational. And the four sheep, though, people like love seeing that, right? They, yeah. they see, oh, the four sheep, four sheep is uh, pretty good. But it's uh, it's one point better than two sheep from the board. Yeah, yeah, and so we're we're on the same page here. And now um, the the uh, Lumen's whipping boy here. Uh, yeah. You know, mine was geologist. His is oven firing boy. Um, I have seen oven firing boy be very useful in one game I've played in a couple of hundreds. I have I don't really think I've ever seen geologist be really good in a four player game. I just had to, you know, I had to give oven firing boy his due. I saw him be really useful in one game. Are you sure it was it? Are you sure it wasn't with a combo from the expansions? <laughs> Are you sure? Oh, uh, maybe you're right. 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 Upon further review, I think I agree with Lumen. This probably is the worst card in the set, but in my defense, everything after Oven Firing Boy sucks and I've never played any of them anyhow. I, I'm actually considering playing Roughcaster with some uh, intense day labor cottage or loam pit stuff. So. You, I, that's fair. I occasionally think about playing him. Wall Builder is my worst one. Uh, it's just, again, the tempo on this one sucks. You have to play it before you build rooms, and then you get the food and dribbles. Um, and it's not enough food. It, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, so it, it's just it's finding time to play it and use it is almost always a mistake. Yeah. It was surprisingly oh, fun uh... bashing on these bad occupations. I yeah. loved I loved this. The F tier was fun. Uh, I, I I'm actually sad I missed some of them. I missed my my boy the lutenist. I lutenist. I I hate the lutenist. I, I should put lutenist worse. Like God, man. We covered its, anyway. its downsides for you. Yeah. Okay. That's, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you. <laughs> uh, okay. Cool. Did you? Uh, did, are you guys good? Can we dive right into these minor improvements? You want to get a glass of water? I, like, I, I take like up too much time. Okay, let's yeah. go grab a, a glass of water and, and uh, let's uh, dive back into uh, minor improvements. Perfect. Okay, welcome back, folks. Fired up here with uh, Lumen and Ryan. And uh, let's dive right into these minor improvements, starting with the very, 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 very fun card to play, Caravan. So, uh, <laughs> Ryan, you're laughing here. I'll let you start, my friend. Why is Caravan the number one pick always? It's it's just stupidly strong. It combos with a ton of 
This is people are going to build rooms. You want to be the first person to grow if you have rooms. Growth is good. It gets you more actions. It's kind of a mandatory thing you need to do. Caravan allows you to get room on a start player action, which is already like pretty busted and strong. It's easier to collect three wood and three food in this set than it is five wood and two reed in order to build a room. And then, yeah, it creates just busted combos with a lot of other cards because now you don't actually have a room, but you are able to grow. And so stuff like small scale farmer can keep going. Stuff, other stuff can keep going. Um, it's dumb. It's so dumb. It's very bannable. You should ban it. Um, on BGA, it's banned, and it probably will forever be banned. Competitive players in tournaments will never use this card. Love it. Shouldn't have made it. Shouldn't have made it through playtesting. Um, and so, uh, what play test? Caravan, we'll move on. Sorry, what? Yeah, and <laughs> we'll uh, <laughs> we'll leave it there. Um, very important to note that our occupational rankings and our improvement rankings were with the we're with we're all done with the fact that caravan was not part of competitive play so while we have caravan here ranked as number one um we never considered it in these minor improvement rankings we didn't consider it in our occupation rankings it's just there because you know it's a card in the set you might see it but it is not in the competitive version of the sets off to the races with loom and lumen i will let you go ahead with this because this is your number two ranked card um Unlike occupations, where we agreed kind of one through four, uh, we're just a little bit off here uh, amongst our top rated. I think we all very loosely agree on kind of exactly why these cards are strong, but Lumen will go with you on your number two, and then we'll let Ryan go with uh, his number two on Big Country. So go yeah. ahead, Lumen. So Loom is just incredibly flexible, and because we've seen so many sheep additions to the game in the occupations, uh, I think that overall getting sheep bonus points and extra food throughout the game and the printed point on the card make it the most reliable minor improvement um, overall. And I think the, the goal that's very commonly achievable is to get two bonus points off of this, which means that for two wood, you have received three points in total and five food during the late rounds of the game that you wouldn't otherwise get. I love it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's exceptionally strong, and uh, it is the only combo of economy, printed points, and bonus points in the game. Um, and so that's in the notes there. It's strong across almost every single setup. Very important to note for, you know, maybe more intermediate-style Agricola players, this card set is light on printed points. So these minor improvements with printed points, like, just immediately apply a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of priority that you otherwise would not um, in, in your normal Agricola play. And you can actually see some evidence of this if you watch like a random BGA game. You'll see that the higher rated players often end up with the minor improvements with points on them. Yep. It's, Absolutely. It, it's really easy to underestimate how just while you're playing minor improvements, if you're scoring like four points on those and somebody else isn't, that four points is huge in this game, right? So. Yeah. Fire me up. Okay, big country. Uh, this is one of the most fun cards to pull off if you can. Ryan, talk to us. Yeah, so continuing the theme, cards that give you points and food are great. Um, this one it unlocks its own like complete play style, basically, of trying to like rush to fill your farm, but you get huge payoffs if you could do it. Uh, you can play a big country game where you basically just plow a lot, take a lot of wood fence, and you play this for like seven points and 14 food um, and just like never grow. That's a really like kind of fun and interesting way. It's hard to, can be hard to pull that off. You can grow first and then play this for like five or four points and a bunch of food. You can even sometimes just like have a big family and play it late for two points and four food. It's more flexible than you think, and it's just very strong to have those that huge point and food injection. Um, and so I rarely pass it. Perfect. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, wonderful, super fun card. I love that you added a little bit about the fact that it's more flexible than you think, uh, because I think a lot of people, when they see someone pull off like one of these like seven-point big country games, they might pass on it in a different draft thinking, uh, that's not the type of game I'm about to play right here, or that's not like the draft doesn't support this. And so just pointing out its flexibility, I think, was a really important part of the card. 
Yeah, even a, a minor improvement that has two free points and four food is great. There's very few cards uh, that we are going to go through the rest of these where it has anywhere as good of a payoff as that. So even if you play this quite yep. late, it's pretty strong. So, Carpenter's Brawler. So this is my number two card. This is uh, for, you know, the season degree club players. Um, this is the uh, Axe, I believe. It's called the Axe, right? Yep. Um, so it's the Axe and the, the other version of the game. Uh, the Carpenter's Parlor is, I call, the best discounter in the game. Um, I mentioned it earlier when I was talking about Brushwood Collector. The Brushwood Collector allows you to trade the two reed for one wood. Carpenter's Parlor says you only need two wood for your room. So, you know, if you can get nine wood early, you get, you know, your five rooms off the bat. I mean, it, it, one of these things is interesting. When we were chatting about this, Lumen, I had originally in the notes wrote that this is an, a, a nine wood discount. And Lumen says, don't say that because then people are going to think it's okay to spend 15 wood on rooms. <laughs> um, actually, Lumen, because the Carpenter's Parlor is, is relatively straightforward, can you just talk a little bit about that? Because that's an important strategic element of the game that we haven't really touched on yet. That is how many wooden rooms can you build or should you build? Right. Uh, I would love to hear something about that. So I think for this video, it might be best to just leave it pretty quickly that you want to spend... You want to take a lot of wood in the game, and you want to spend most of it on fencing relatively early. Um, Shadow's favorite rule, we mentioned Shadow, the video I have with Shadow once in the previous section. His rule is that if you're spending more than six wood on rooms, think again. Um, and it applies to Carpenter, the occupation, uh, which lets you build two wooden rooms for six wood, and it applies to Carpenter's Parlor for sure as well, because you can afford three wooden rooms with six wood. Yep. Love it. Okay. Sleeping Corner. So Sleeping Corner is, again, I, I like it, you know, just a tad more than you guys, but Ryan, I'll, I'll flip it over to you. Why is Sleeping Corner strong? And um, what is, you know, having access to that family growth will allow you to do? Yeah. So uh, this card is very nice because growing your family is a good source of points, actually. Like, you kind of want to have five family members at the end of the game because that's 15 points. Three per person is quite a bit. And you don't always want to be building the rooms, as we're saying. So Sleeping Corner's real strength lies in having, like, a three-person family till the end game, getting your farming done, getting those grain fields down, playing Sleeping Corner, and then being able to take Urgent Wish for children in the late game, even if you don't have rooms, even if other people are start playing and taking it, you get to guaranteedly get your family up to five members. Um, it combos really well with those big country game plans we talked about above. Um, you can get those late actions. Um, and there's just so much grain in the set. Getting two grain fields is pretty easy a lot of times. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um Mantelpiece. This special shout out to Mantelpiece is uh, my wife's favorite card. Uh, my wife is a is a pretty intense board gamer. She's extremely strong at a Greek lad. And, um, lately has been beating me more often than I've been beating her. So uh, Mantelpiece is her favorite card. Uh, she just absolutely loves it. So uh, Lumen, why is Mantelpiece so powerful? Mantelpiece is really nice because there are so many justifications in other cards and combos you can find for renovating to clay early or renovating to stone early. The negative three and the net points, you want to think about if you stay just in clay, if you never renovate to stone, that's still fine because the earlier you get these bonus points, you can still spend the stone that you would otherwise be spending to like renovate to stone. You can buy a well, you can buy the stone oven, you can buy the basket maker's workshop with that stone you're not spending for the renovation anymore. You're not going to usually lose ways to spend the stone. And just increasing your point ceiling with these bonus points is awesome when you have a combo. Yep. Straightforward. So Moldboard Plow. So I want to go through Moldboard Plow, actually, because on its surface, it seems like a very straightforward card. And it is a straightforward card. You know, you start player, you put two fields on it. It is very powerful. I love Moldboard Plowed. I like I love drafting it. I love having it. I because plows are just hard to come by in the set. But one of the things that you still did is you still played a start player action. And then you plowed twice for four fields. So you took three actions for four fields. So really what you did is you traded two wood for a plow. 
in a way, right? Like how come, how come this is so much stronger than what I just described? Why, why is it like you guys, I, I need Lumen. Why is this like, I know empirically that this is stronger, but why is it so much stronger than that? So, uh, I think the only thing you're missing is that you counted start player as a full action. And I consider the minor improvement you play on start player to be half an action, uh, in my evaluations. Okay. Um, and because you can play this on family growth also, right? You can like fit it naturally into your game. Um, and then if we say that your benefit is a field and half an action, sign me up. A minor improvement, that's a really nice benefit. <laughs> yeah, that's really strong. And, and the only other thing I would add in, in your math is that plowing a field is obviously not an action you can always get on. It's a, it can be a first pick in yeah. the later rounds of the game. So only having to fight for that space twice is a benefit to you. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, obviously I, I ranked it very similar to you guys here and I, I do know it's strong, but I, I just feel like um, for the audience, especially that was, it's, a, it's very straightforward to kind of figure out what the value of an action is there in, in this case. And, uh, I never actually thought of star player like that as half an action, so I'm, I think I'm going to start trying to think about it that way. I, I love that. Um, Beanfield. So I'll take Beanfield. It is one food for one printed point. Um, and printed points are at a premium in this set. Um, actually, for a long time in our home game, we played that this also counted as a field because you know we had the, the version where the field was kind of on it. It wasn't this actual version. and It looks like a field, and it says that it's a field, and so we thought it was a field. And I was like, this card's amazing. <laughs> like, it's an extra field. It's a point, print, point. It's like the, the freest of free. So it actually is not counted as a field. Um, for but, story, uh, it counts you know, for still... prerequisites. Exactly, yeah. For prerequisites, but not for scoring. It's very, very strong card. Not much else to say. The fact that it can grow vegetables is not super relevant all the time, but sometimes can be. Um, mini Pasture. So Ryan, you like this card a bit more than than Lumen and I do. So uh, go for it. Yeah, I mean, we probably all view it about the same. I again, I have a hard time ranking some of these where the best upside is pretty high. One of the great parts of mini pasture is kind of early in the game. If you really want to have early breeding sheep to set up an early sheep walker, and you also maybe have a loom in your hand, um, mini pasture is really great at setting that up. Um, being able to take a being able to turn two wood into or two food into four wood is already great. Turning it into a fence action is great. Um, if you have the extra food and you can do this while your family growing, that's a great option. It, it's it's just a very nice card to be able to get a little bit of fencing out of the way um, on a minor improvement action and just to get some wood in a set that sometimes can be wood tight but is almost never food tight. So um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but how often is this in? Just talk to me a little bit about this lumen. Um, how often does mini pasture indicate to you that you can build extra stables? Because the way that I'm thinking about when I see mini pasture is that this could be like 16 wood in the game. Is that true? Like, is that a good way to be thinking about it? Or am I being too, too blasé with uh, my you wood? Can, uh, if you see your opponents at the table all having a bunch of food and potentially not enough wood, then yeah, 16 wood's getting added to the game. I think that's a fair thing to assume. Okay, awesome. Also, uh, Ryan, can you just talk very briefly about sheep stealing? Because the first time some of our viewers here get sheep stolen, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, it, 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 talk to me about sheep stealing. That's true. So you should also be really careful if your game plan involves getting the getting that early clay, building that first fireplace, and you're just letting the sheep stack up. You have to be really careful that somebody doesn't have mini pasture because some round you're going to pass on the sheep, have no actions left, and the person after you is going to start player with a mini pasture and take all the sheep next round. Um, so it is always important to be careful about how high you're letting those sheep stack because it can be a big risk. Yeah, love it. Okay, rammed clay. Rammed clay, I, I call it in the notes. It's the ultimate comfort card. Uh, Lumen. Hit us up. What's what's good with rammed clay? Rammed clay benefits a lot from all the clay that can be added in the game, or in some games. We've seen in the occupations, like, at least three cards that add some clay to the game. If clay is added to the game, well, now nobody else wants clay that piles on the board as much. It's a lot easier to get six clay or four clay than it is to get six wood or four wood in a four-player game. 
So you're getting the same fencing value out of those actions, but they're less contested by the table. And to just have that ability for free while getting a fence's worth of resources when playing it, pretty solid. I will add one additional note. In this particular set of minor improvements, there are very few that are free. It's sure. like very rare for there to be like a free minor improvement at all, meaning that it is, and you know, like in BGA, the implementation of BGA, you know which seat you're going to be in before the draft. If you are the third or the fourth seat, um, sometimes your best kind of course of action in the first, very first round is to, you know, take three wood and start player, or take awk and start player, and in some rare cases, take your RSF and start player. Um, Ram clay is a fantastic, uh, you know, a fantastic way to do that. Um, we'll dive into mining hammer. So mining hammer, um, I'll just take this one. I, I love mining hammer encourages reno actions, which are again, very point efficient. They give you two stables without having to build them. Sometimes if you're doing late fencing, this can be really useful. Um, the, the stables are two points, right? So it's kind of like two bonus points with the additional, um, benefit of added capacity. Um, and you can generally play Mining Hammer really easily. It's just one wood. You can do it on your first growth and then, you know, maybe Reno. It just fits really nicely into the tempo of the game. Um, gives you some points. When you play it, you get one food, which can sometimes be relevant, especially when you're growing, um, especially if you're growing right before, you know, it, there's a whole bunch of reasons why Mining Hammer just tends to work in a lot of game plans. Um, nice card. Stronger, actually, than it looks. And so I think until people really get used to this uh, card, this will maybe fall to you more often than otherwise it would. It, it's just, it looks like an understated card, but it's pretty great. Speaking of clay, Lone Pit. Lone Pit is pretty cool. So uh, go ahead, Ryan, with the, the Lone Pit. Yeah, uh, you need three occupations, but then it's a food to a point. Uh, that's already a good enough card, uh, but then it gives you three clay every time you day labor. The real strength of this card is the combos on the set. Um, honestly, at, even at 11, I, I hesit like I often have drafted this higher or kind of drafted it to make sure not to pass it to somebody I know that I already gave them other stuff because uh, some of the combos that ensue can be very strong. If you manage to get that rammed clay up above as well or whatever, like yeah, it's it can be very useful to get all that extra clay and make use of it. It's a great reason to build clay rooms as well. Yeah, I look at this too, and you know, I look right down here and have better turn rank twelve and lump at rank fifteen, and I I regret my decision. <laughs> lump it is fantastic. Like I don't know what I, what was I thinking uh, when I when I I gonna have to adjust that before we publicize this, but yeah, lump lump it is what a great card. Uh, I, uh, looking at this fifteen makes me regret my decisions. Um, better turn. <laughs> uh, Lumen, talk to me about Butter Chair. You talk to me about Loom. These two yeah. go fantastic together. Um, go ahead. Yeah, they sure do go fantastic together. And the the prerequisite is a little weird. Um, it means that Butter Turn should be played earlier if you can make it happen. Uh, but it's it's got a printed point on it, right, guys? Like, it's going to give yeah. you a couple food late in the game, maybe up to like four to six food late in the game if you've gone high animal strategy. Uh, you're getting a point for a wood. There's nothing wrong with it. Yep. Yep. Love it. Strawberry patch. Uh, Rainer, you like this substantially more than Lumen and I. Um, yeah. You know, like. <sighs> Probably have it's, this one a little I high too, but uh, again, as we're saying, anything where I'm spending wood and getting points and food, it's a great card. Yeah, it's it. The reason, obviously, uh, just for the viewers, if you didn't catch on there, uh, Moomin and I have this rank, you know, quite a bit behind Ryan here. Is sometimes it can be hard to play, and you know, not always, uh, but sometimes it can be hard to play. Sometimes it's hard to get two vegetable fields. It's hard to There's no have your vegetables in the ground. When you, set, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, when you have time to play this, it, it's, it's hard. Some, it, it it's hard. hard. It's hard to get two veg fields, and you're often not going to get food out of it. So it is often just a wood to two points that you're playing in round fourteen. Um, so, but that yeah. is way better than two wood for one point with a stable action at the end. So, it, it, yeah, I, I I often like just having it in my hand. It's it's. Uh, I guess again, it's kind of drafting points daily. Like it, it makes sure that you have continued yeah. ways to score points in the late game. Um, it, it should probably be lower that I have it, but 
I think it's probably higher than you guys have it. So uh, whatever, I'll stick by it and we'll yeah, keep going. It's good. Well, no, it's a good balance too, right? Because again, it's probably a very slight play style thing, right? As well, where you you maybe have more opportunities to play it than Lumen and I do. And so I think it makes perfect sense. Um, we'll move on to Lumber Mill. I love Lumber Mill. I think it's just very, it's, it's very nice. Sometimes, sometimes actually in this particular set, you can get a, a minor improvement hand that is seven cards or it's lumber mill and then six you know, minor improvements that are all, that all cost one or two wood. Um, that it's like, that's how useful it can sometimes be, especially if you draft lumber mill early enough and kind of draft around that where it is a nice feeling to have all these free minor improvements in your hand. Um, you know, ma- match it with a butter turn, match it with a strawberry patch. Like, you know, you have all these points in your hand, all these free minor improvements. Uh, but yeah, the lumber mill, the wood discount can be sneaky good. And two stone to two points is, is actually is, is quite strong as well. Um, nice to have. Great card. Anything that I'm missing there? No. Uh, it also, okay. it does work on, it does work on um, the well in the joinery. So my major yeah. improvements count. The milk too. jug. So... I I look. Did I lose you guys? I hear you still. Yeah. Do you hear us, Chris? Oh, oh he was delayed again. Uh, so yeah, milk jug. Uh, you have it the highest. So let's. Why? Why do I love milk jug? Uh, I mean, Hi there, guys. All right, you back, Chris? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, we decided that I would take milk jug. Um, so I think the notes are pretty good uh, on this one. It's. It's one of the miners here that cost one clay. One clay can be a little awkward to get early, but Milk Jug, you don't want to play early because Cattle Market doesn't show up until round 10 or 11. And once it does show up, it's, it's really weird, but you're going to almost certainly get nine or more food out of Milk Jug. So one clay to nine food. You can count it as one clay to six food if you assume Milk Jug's always getting played, but either way, that's still a good trade-off. So, guys, can I, I I have to do a mea culpa to the audience here because when we first did these rankings here, I had Milk Jug like, I think it was like 41st or something like that. And I, I just like got it, kind of thought it was a throwaway minor. Both these guys were like, are you dumb? Milk Jug is 41. Like, what are you talking about? It's so, it's such a great source of late game food. And it was like, yeah, but like other people get food and like, you know, what, what is like three or three or six food? And they're like, what, like, it's not three or six. It's like nine or twelve food. Like the the cows gets taken like every single round, and I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. Like, and I'm looking at it again, being like, this is pr- this is pretty good food source. At the end. like, it was almost like I just yeah, you know, just a huge leap, right? Like, obviously, I don't draft it that much, and so I don't play it that much. So I don't understand it. Where whereas probably the other people I'm playing with like have this milk jug, and I'm like, oh, milk jug's not that good. But I don't. I, I'm not even realizing how much how much benefit they're getting from it. So. I, I, I love just talking to these guys and hopefully, you know, th- this card ranking can do, do what it did for me to, to, you know, for, for our audience here as well. Um, I, and I, I adjusted my milk jug ranking uh, with that in mind, with the nine food in mind. Uh, so I, I didn't throw our, our ECR off too much. Um, speaking of throwing our ECR off, um, threshing board, I <laughs> think this card is fantastic. This could be a small sample size bias. Um, you know, Lumen and Ryan, you guys still think it's pretty strong. I have it in my top 10. Um, to me, this is like, I love, love, I love having this card in my hand because to me, this is like one of the only cards that single-handedly opens up this baking bread strategy where like kind of at the beginning of the game, if if maybe my pers- preferred source of feeding doesn't go the right way or, you know, maybe I have some of those early grain, early grain ox and like, you know, I'm more likely to want to play those and, and get that early grain and get going. And to me, the farmland space and being able to bake bread just kind of go really well together. I think there's actually, um, I don't, I don't know this for sure. There is there a very, there's a very strong card in regular Agricola that, that matches those two things together. Correct. Uh, if you're thinking about field watchman, that gives you a plow on grain seeds. So not quite the same. But... Got it. Okay. Oh, gives you a plow on grain seeds. Yeah. Oh, that's that is very good. Holy uh, moly! It, it does actually. It did get reprinted in the uh, C deck expansion, if that ever comes to BGA. But expect it to probably be banned by then too. Holy moly! Okay, so never mind. I thought there was a baking bread thing that was wrong. So that's ridiculous. <laughs> Plow grain seeds. Holy shit. Um, okay. Anyway, threshing board. All that to say, I'm very high on it. 
it enables a lot of baking bread strategies. So, so actually, you know, if you're relatively new to Agricola, or even if you're, you know, an intermediate level player and you don't do a lot of baking bread strategies, try this card out, you know, draft it, build an oven, get that storehouse keeper, build an oven. Get your, your grain board. into the ground first, though. Get your grain into the ground. Yeah. Get your grain into the ground. Um, a hundred percent. One of the funniest things I, you know, my mother-in-law is loves playing with us, and she's not quite as strong as my wife or I. Um, when we play, she always <laughs> she bakes, she gets the grain and then bakes it, and then she's like, "What have I done? I was I was too. I was, what have I done? I was too greedy. I I, I don't have. A, now I have to go get the grain again. I was like, put your grain in the ground. What are you doing? <laughs> so." I, I always uh, always remember that. Make sure you get that grain in the ground. Um, sorry for taking so long on threshing board. We will dive into shifting cultivation. Lumen, why is this a strong card? Uh, it gives you the field when you want it and kind of attacks the table in some ways. Um, in my experience, it's best played in round 13 to start player and get that extra field for a round 14 cultivation move where you plow another field on top of this one and you sow your crops. Uh, it goes yeah. hand in hand with the idea that you want to clear off all your fields by round 14. So you can definitely play shifting cultivation earlier if you are growing, you have extra food, you haven't plowed yet or you want more plows, totally fine. It's good that way. I think it's really one of the best possible late game miners. Love it. Uh, bottles. Bottles is a point ceiling card. I am actually interested, Ryan. What do you think the best cost for this card is? Uh, I mean, that's so variable. Um, uh, paying two clay and two food early you know that's the cheapest but is that the best probably not it's the sweet spots probably in the mid game like pay three clay three food but honestly bottles is a little tricky like that cost is i think more than a lot of people really realize like clay is i don't know it, it you can have plenty of it in some set sometimes and you might have plenty of food but having plenty of both and then finding the time to play it is a little tricky, but having four points is great. Again, there's not a lot of ways to get all that many points, so yeah. it's good. But I, I think it's I think it's easy to overdraft this card. So there's actually in the uh, the expansion sets, the B, C, and D sets of um, A, B, C, and D sets of uh, Greek Low Revised, there is an acknowledgement of this. And uh, and Lumen and Lumen and Ryan, I don't know how much experience you have with those sets, but. There are a lot of two clay, like three or four point cards that have some requirement to make them make you play them really early. And at first I was overdrafting those cards a lot when we first started playing with the expansions. And it's like, this sucks. Like you have to waste so much tempo to get this point stealing. And it's often not worth it. And right. it kind of made me think of bottles. And I was like, oh, bottles, you know, it's because sometimes uh, they even have some of these expansion cards where it's like two clay for four points, but all you have to do is play it in the first you know, a couple turns or something like that. And it's like, oh, that is, that is tough to do because it, it you almost waste an entire round sometimes doing that kind of stuff to get your points. And so in any case, I, I'm digressing from the purpose of this video, but the, the clay early is sometimes very challenging. If you are going to play bottles, don't always try to play it for as cheap as possible. Right. Absolutely not. Pond hut. Um, Go ahead uh, with Pond Hut, Lumen. Pond Hut is a sad variant of the Duck Pond that original Agricola players know and love. Uh, the original version of this card didn't cost a wood. It didn't need exactly two occupations. It just needed two occupations or more. It gave you a free point in three food. That's like top tier minor improvement. Uh, that apparently was too top tier for the balancers of this game. So it now costs a wood and requires exactly two occupations. It's awkward to play many times. You don't want to spend that wood too early many times. The payoff's good, but the, the timing is an issue for me. Yeah, and actually I think this is one of these uh, cases where play style matters. Like I, I find that I often can pair up Pond Hut with my first growth. Maybe that's because I'm playing a lot of games where I have two ox early, and that's kind of like the normal tempo of my game where it just feels like, Pond Hut kind of fits right there. Like I play it on my first growth very often. I really like it there, you know, and maybe uh, 
you know, Lumen is, is not doing that. He's playing a lot of games where he's got more, more ox or less ox. And it's just like one of these things where if you find that pond hunt is working well for you, keep drafting it. And if it's not working well for you, pass it on. It's not that impactful in, in either case. Right. Um, hand plow. Um, again, I'll just uh, stick on hand plow because I don't think it needs either of you guys. Plows are good in this game. Plows are rare in this game. And it's nice to have a plow on a minor improvement action. Acorn basket. So acorn basket. Uh, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, yeah, turning one reed into two boar is pretty nice. Um, you do have to have three occupations to play it, but this can be a nice kind of mid-game start player, especially if you already have some fences or stables, or even if you just have a hearth, turning a reed into effectively six food is totally fine. Um, uh, and if it can give you, if you can actually hold the boar and breed them, that's very can be quite strong. Um, uh honestly i think it's another card though that sometimes yeah you have the three occupations of the extra read can occasionally be an obnoxious card to find the time to get out agree yep uh shepherd's crook lumen a lot of the reasons i like shepherd's crook is because it gives you a very obvious way to get your sheep to enable the better minor improvements in this set Loom, Butter Churn, Shepherd's Crook. It's a really nice synergy of stuff all together. Um, definitely aim a lot of the time to enable yourself to get two activations of Shepherd's Crook. Um, you can even do that at once. If you can get four sheep and all your fences in one action, that's pretty darn good to me. Uh, but it definitely needs some help. I would rarely play this without any other sheep helpers. Got it. Makes perfect sense. And actually, uh, our very next card here, Major, goes pretty well with it. So, Lumen, maybe you can just continue. Yeah, along. so, uh, I mean, if we just read the descriptions of Shepherd's Crook and Manger side by side, I am zoomed a bit too far in, but if you cover at least four farmyard spaces twice, you end up with eight or more farmyard spaces covered, and then you get three bonus points. Yeah. Two and three <laughs> points is nice. So. Yeah. Love it. Okay, on to Sack Cart. Sack card is a card that I recognize the value of, but I find very challenging to play in a lot of cases. Ryan, am I off base here, or what's the plan? Well, I, I think the major trap on sack card is using it for maximum efficiency, right? Like, the idea of, of paying two wood for all four grain is great, but now you're paying two early wood, putting your ox down. Honestly, I'm probably play sack card for just a grain on 11 and 14 more than anything else, and... Turning your two wood into two grain and aiming to try to sow those two grain in round 14, it's a pretty efficient way to just score points. Um, and I think that's probably the like, timing and tempo on when you want to pay that wood cost on sack card to make it really actually sing. But it's a very mediocre card. A lot of times in this set, there's just better ways to get grain. But Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And so sack card, we're at the halfway point of the miners here. So... May, or uh, makes it into the top half of our miners in, in our expert consensus ranking. Um, and we're moving on to corn scoop. And Lumen, I'm going to flip it over to you because you are the grain seed action hater. Yeah. But you like corn scoop quite a bit more than Rainier and I. So hit us up with the, with the knowledge here. I'm not quite sure this explanation is satisfactory. But for me and, and how I feel about taking two grain at once for the baking strategies in this game, it feels so much better to me than taking a grain plus a vegetable or a grain plus three food is a minor improvement we'll see later or a grain pay a food for a cow. I mean, it, those things are much less synergistic than just getting another grain so you can bake them all. So, you know what? So honestly, that actually is pretty satisfactory. So what you're saying is two grain in one action is much better than two times better than one grain. It's like three or four times better is what you're telling me in terms of like how Maybe. how well yeah. it works in your strategy. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Sometimes Some things don't scale literally, right? right? It's Instead of it being twice as good, it's actually four times right. as good. Utility, hard to matters. See that. Utility matters a lot. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Um, canoe. So, Canoe is a card that is fantastic with fishing synergy. Really nice with Harpooner in particular. Um, and otherwise, it is uh, not that great. But it's a printed point, and sometimes it gets you some extra read and some extra food. Um, if you are going to play Canoe, you better have a plan to play Basket Maker's Workshop. That's 
that's all that I'll say around the canoe. Clearing Spade. So Clearing Spade, again, is a, is a fun card, similar to Scythe Worker, to watch experts play with. So, Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I'm honestly continuing. The more I keep playing with the set a little bit over the last week or two, I think I maybe need to keep moving this up. It uh, it does allow you to do some really tricky things. You you can sow you know a vegetable or a grain and start spreading them onto your extra fields, and then try to sow them all one more time once they clear off. Yeah. The fact that they clear off so fast means that yeah, you can really accelerate some of your crop points. Uh, I find clearing speed when you're kind of planning for it is often can turn into like saving you an action or two in terms of maxing out your crop points um and so a wood to an action is pretty good bread paddle bread paddle lumen more baking bread uh obviously this is not as good as threshing board but you know so what do you think? instead of threshing board you're getting a food instead of a printed point and you change the, the timing of when you get those bake actions. But as we saw with the ox, there's a couple of ox that just give you a grain immediately. So if you have bread paddle and a couple of those, you're basically getting five food and the ox effect by paying the ox payout of the grain. I think there's enough synergy to make bread paddle sneaky useful a lot of times. And just rebaking grain, if you have a ton of grain, this allows you to use the clay oven a lot more than one might in an original version of Agricola Gay. Hello? Got it. Yeah, and so what about Large Greenhouse? Large Greenhouse obviously has a lot of uh, reminiscence to our stack card here. And so, uh, you know, Ryan, is it kind of the same thing here? You're playing it not for that, you know, four or seven, nine, but you're, you're, you're playing it really for, you know, one or two veggies here? Probably I'm not playing it for one veggie, but yes, it, I think this card is totally fine to play with the intention of only getting the two vegetables off of it. Two wood into two vegetables is fine, and again, you sow them late. Um, it, you need two ox, you need two extra wood. You get a decent payout for that if you're in that situation, but again, it's just the trickiness of do you have two extra wood or is that slowing down your rooms? Do you have the two ox out already? Are you wanting to take a start player action anyhow? If all those things are together, totally a good card, but the situation comes up occasionally. God. And uh, Lumen, you you seem to be the the sheep lover uh, of the uh, the group here, so we'll move over to you for wool blankets. Yeah, the problem with wool blankets is that it really needs some specific circumstances to be right. Like wool blankets is the perfect helper if you want to play Mantelpiece and never get to stone, because here's another two bonus points for doing that. But most times you have five sheep. I don't know. My experience is that that doesn't affect your ability to renovate or not. Often, if you're getting a lot of sheep early, that also says to me you're doing a stone house strategy to get the actions back in non-people ways. So, I don't or, you're running yeah. or you're running Sheepwalker and effectively have a bunch of stone. So. Right. Yeah, no, love it. Uh, moving on to Stone Tongs. Stone Tongs is obviously reminiscent of our Stone Cutter on the Ox side. Stone Cutter is substantially better than Stone Tongs because you don't have to visit those stone spaces. Um, just gives you, like, the stone discount is obviously more impactful than the extra stone on, on every stone accumulation space. Not much else to say about this. Um, hard Porcelain, though, I would love some insight from the two of you because I like this, you know, quite substantially more than the two of you do like i i find hard porcelain i love playing it you know get it get a six clay grab and then buy a major and you know all this kind of stuff and it gives you some flexibility and let's yeah i, I don't know like what's I, i'm i'm actually I, I still don't understand this one we haven't had the chance to talk about it yet who are you playing I with, this was who are you playing with that's allowing you to get six clay grabs with regularity Oh, well, not, I mean, not regularity. It's just, you know, it's... Uh, so here's it's, a... No. You know. My, my big issue with it is simply, like, I think it's hard to get that much extra clay and then want to inject that much extra stone in the game. Um, now, if you have a low pit or a clay hut builder, maybe. Now, you would love clay hut builder, so... It's the clay hut builder thing, yeah. I think we can move on and just explain it with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. 
Yeah, f- fair enough. You know, maybe you know what is actually probably true. It, this, it's a small sample size thing. I probably played a handful of games with Clay Huff Builder and Hard Porcelain together, and then I'm like, these cards are amazing. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> these cards are incredible. Uh, Thick Forest. S- speaking of a lot of clay, um, Thick Forest. Uh, Lumen, go ahead. Uh, I have this pretty low. Uh, it's because I don't often have five clay in my early game supply when the wood payouts would be most. Um, if you find yourself doing a play style or before renovating early that you have a lot of clay in your supply, great. But, I mean, it's kind of a speculative pick, and most times it won't pay off much in my experience. Yeah, with you. Um, Lasso. I think Lasso is a, a prime card for uh, beginners to overdraft. It just oh. feels fun. It feels like, oh, I'm going to steal those animals. That's amazing. Um, it certainly was, you know, uh, a card that I thought was stronger at first glance, but... Uh, you know, Ryan, how come it's uh, how come it's not that strong? Uh, yeah, the thing is, you really don't want to use it that much um, because you don't you you really don't want to take single animal grabs. Um, so you're really only using it when you're otherwise going to be taking animals anyhow, and then you get to take your next most favorite action. But you're also giving the table information about what actions you're taking, um, and so they have more kind of ability to work around what you're doing there and occasionally it's going to be pretty good you're going to be in position to take a pair of cows and do something else but i think usually i wind up using lasso maybe once or twice and then at that point that read cost can be annoying in some games um yeah yeah i'm with you um we're up against now uh, a handful of cards that we can kind of group together in a way because scholarly Drinking trough, junk room, and clay pipe, while they do different things, all have kind of this, you know, these these single clay issues with them. And we'll, we'll maybe we'll just do scholarly and junk room together, um, because you know the other ones are a little bit, they're just a little bit different. But scholarly, junk room, and, and maybe even clay pipe. Uh, Lumen, can you just talk a little bit about these cards and why they're kind of closer to the bottom of our right. rankings here? So these are cards that, like, if they didn't have a cost, you'd want to play super early, right? But the fact that you want to play them early, they need a clay cost, it's the same problem as Thick Forest. Like, why are you going to have a pile of clay in your supply early? You're going to spend that for renovating or a cooking hearth very quickly. So it's just hard to write, like get the right timing for this. I have a high rank on Scullery relatively. I think I played it a lot when I was first playing the set and liked it. And maybe I need to change my ranking again. So uh, yeah. on, that, no, it, on, on that front, I want to talk about Drinking Trough. Um, yeah, no, yeah, no, fair enough, Ryan, because yeah, t- Ryan's here at the 25. I didn't even see that. Um, <laughs> me, and, me and Lumen are down in the mid-40s. Uh, so we, we are drafting it hyper bottom of the barrel, and Ryan is actually drafting it just very below the midpoint. So where, I mean, where are we at here with this drinking trough, buddy? Same thing. Realistically, I don't think I'm taking it this high anymore. I think I had a couple games where I liked it. I will say I think it's a little bit of the mini pasture thing. I think it's fun to play the drinking trough and have a little more room. I also think I overdraft Organic Farmer hoping to hit drinking trough. That's a fun little combo <laughs> yeah. um, to get extra points. And on that front, I do think drinking trough's a little better than you two have it rated because uh, okay. the Organic Farmer combo is actually pretty sweet to be able to set up a couple extra points in games. You're gonna spend a clay no, on that, though. Uh, <laughs> again, that's the tough part. You do have to have a clay and organic farmer. It's a it's it's a decent number of actions for a dubious number of points. So it's pretty bad. It should yeah. be lower than this. Uh, yeah, the twenty five. I didn't even see that. Thank you for for calling calling yourself out there. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in clay pipe again, clay pipe is very similar to junk room and scholarly in the sense that it looks great in theory. It just, it's hard to get down and sometimes it's hard to make work. I actually do think clay pipe is, is made substantially better by woodcutter, right? Sure. Because you're, you're picking up, you know, that extra, you're hitting that seven building resources by quite often actually with woodcutter. And that means that not only are you getting that extra wood, you're getting two food. Like it kind of like makes it almost like a woodcutter slash mushroom collector without leaving the wood. Like the clay sure. pipe all of a sudden starts to make a little bit of sense. It's a really specific combo, but just for people, yeah. you know, out there thinking about it. Um, young Animal Market. Um, just a good late game way to uh, trade a, sh- a sheep for a cow. Looks like I like it a little bit more than you guys. A sheep is expensive, right? It's expensive to give up a sheep. Just straight up. Not that impactful. 
three field rotation. Three field rotation, I've seen some some pretty cool uses of. It's just really, really hard to make work. Um, often Lumen, you have. Why you talk about that? Often you'd rather spend like a crop in your supply to put into that field and get another crop point. So you're yeah. creating a crop point for three food, which you know doesn't make much of a difference most of the time. That's all there is to that. Uh, looks like Chris might be having yeah. some connection. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Um, oh, sorry about that. I'm 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 back now. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, moving on to herring pot again. It's another one of these like early gameish or our miners that you want to play clay for. Really not that compelling unless you've got like kind of a harpooner, um, canoe combo type of thing. And even then, sometimes you just don't want to play it. It's it like sometimes you don't even want to play it then. It also doesn't do anything at the end of the game. So yeah, yeah. no, fair, fair enough. Um, clay embankment. So clay embankment was my bottom of the barrel uh ryan you have some problems with that obviously uh eh, it's it's totally fine honestly i had a really hard time with this last like 15 miners they're all like really situational and dubious clay embankment every once in a while you're running that clay hut builder or loam pit game and you have rammed clay and this turns into a food for three or four clay that's actually fencing or is actually a room it's pretty good but uh, is that situation that much more common than when I want to play Skullry or whatever? Who knows? It's, it's It was a crapshoot to rank some of these. Fair enough. Goodbye uh, and maybe hello to Chris. Uh, basket, uh, I have ranked higher than the other two guys here. Uh, I think there are just some games where you want to be spamming the wood space and don't want to care about anything else. And for those games, I think basket's fine. Um, it does have huge problems, like these two would, are very likely going to an opponent, so be very careful about it, but, I mean, three food at a time can do something in some strategies, that's all. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. We'll dive into this last few, I know Ryan's got a jump, so, uh, Brooke, um, I liked it a little bit more than others, sometimes those, uh, that early food can help, but it's very, very specific, you have to be on fishing, you have to want to SP, it's just not that flexible of a card uh market stall lumen it is your mr irrelevant it's your last uh your 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 bottom of the barrel so just uh, a quick note on that uh i'd much rather turn the grain into f four or five food in an oven um or resow it for points i want to find other ways of getting vegetables that don't cost me my grain my precious grain <laughs> uh so i'd much rather take a veg off the board than consider playing market stall Love it. Uh, pitchfork, again. Grave seeds, just not a great action. Not much else to say. And we'll end it off with Ryan. I know you gotta go. Why is Dutch Windmill your number one most bottom of the barrel card? It's so expensive. Uh, two stone and two wood for two points is not good. You can always do that by just building the joinery, and the joinery is rarely fought over. The actual action it gives is very rarely are you gonna get any food off of it. Uh, it's just like kind of a complete trap to try to make this whole thing work uh with that said it occasionally has uses if you do wind up in a game that's stone rich and you want to build, play another card maybe you do have the master bricklayer or suddenly dutch windmill or the, does that only work on majors it only uh, works if, on majors maybe, but it puts stone in the game so whatever yeah and maybe you have a stone cutter or whatever like occasionally you're gonna play a dutch windmill but it's yeah yeah um okay guys well Lumen, Ryan, thank you so much for walking through this. Apologies for my constant internet connection and all that crap, but uh, it was super fun doing this with you guys. I know I learned a lot, and uh, I know, Lumen, you're going to post this. Hopefully everyone learns a lot, and we'll make sure that these uh, these car rankings are public for everyone to, to jump in and dive in, and hopefully the community engages with it, and uh, hopefully we hear from some other experts around uh, – you know, why we're wrong in certain spots and why we're right in certain spots and would love to see the community grow here. So thank you so much for your time. You guys are both incredible. Uh, love to see it. Hope to see everyone out on the streets in the, in the Agricola streets. <laughs> yep. Put your questions in the comments. Uh, it might inspire a future video. Yep. Always happy to discuss to you. Feel free to reach out on board game geek or BGA and, uh, yeah. Otherwise, thanks all for watching. And yeah, thanks Lumen and Chris for doing this. It's been fun. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, guys.